Not long ago, the Argentine Air Force had proposed a purchase plan to Congress, intending to spend 664 million U.S. dollars to buy 12 JF-17 Block III Thunder fighter jets from China, at a cost of 55 million U.S. dollars each. However, in such a sudden turn of events, on March 26, Denmark and Argentina signed a letter of intent in Buenos Aires for Denmark to sell 24 used F-16 fighter jets to Argentina, leading to a failed bid for the Chinese JF-17 Thunder. Even more astonishing was the price of these used F-16s, which was remarkably low, 14 million U.S. dollars for a basic model and no more than 27 million U.S. dollars for a high-end version. This starkly contrasts the significantly higher-priced JF-17 Thunder. The reason behind this shift is closely linked to the policy changes following the inauguration of Argentina's new president, Millet. Since 2014, Argentina has shown repeated interest in the JF-17, sending two senior delegations to China and Pakistan in 2022 to evaluate the Thunder, and they were very satisfied with its performance. However, after the conservative candidate Malay's unexpected election in 2023, Argentina's foreign policy swiftly pivoted towards the Western nations. The UK and the USA promptly opened their doors to cooperation, leading to this arms deal in less than four months. Otherwise, allowing the JF-17 into Argentina would mean there would be military cooperation with China. Needless to say, the previous Argentine government had already agreed to let the Chinese military operate a space monitoring station in the southern region of Patagonia. Though officially claimed to be a space observation and exploration base, the secretive nature of the nation's construction and operation has raised suspicions. Along with the prohibition of civilian access to the nearby area, it is suspected to serve as an overseas military and espionage base for the Chinese military. This is equivalent to trespassing in America's backyard, especially considering the trade history between Argentina and China. The U.S. had to greenlight Argentina's purchase of the used Danish F-16s. Thus, this arms deal is not merely a transaction. It represents Western nations using military sales to influence Argentine foreign policy. The U.S. tacit approval of the arms sale is aimed at integrating Argentina into the Western bloc to counter Russia and China. For countries with limited budgets, the F-16, despite its age, remains an advanced Western fighter with a robust support system that continues to perform well after upgrades. Crucially, approval from the UK and the US will help integrate Argentina into the Western world, providing Malay's government with increased political and economic support and greater control over Argentina's politics. The JF Thunder's failure in this bid has shown that the jet was used merely as a bargaining tool in negotiations with the F-16 to drive down its price. These countries never truly intended to purchase the Thunder. Furthermore, Argentina's sudden switch from the Chinese JF-17 to the used F-16s may seem like a routine military purchase, but is backed by complex geopolitical maneuvers. On April 9th, President Malay announced a diplomatic reclamation on the sovereignty of the Falkland Islands. Just four days earlier, at midnight, he had a secretive meeting with Commander Richardson in the U.S. Southern Command at the naval base in Ushuaia the city closest to Antarctica. In this meeting, President Malay made a remarkable promise to establish a joint naval base with the U.S. in the region, describing it will be a logistics center and the closest port to Antarctica, helping to turn our country into the entry point to the White Continent. It will also help improve the local economy and give support to scientific research conducted by several international Antarctica projects. Evidently, the U.S. has suggested to Argentina that a military base there could balance the British military presence on the Falkland Islands. However, given that the U.S. and the U.K. are close allies, it is unlikely that they would turn against each other for Argentina. Instead, the real motive behind the U.S. interest in Antarctica may lie elsewhere. 
Antarctica is known to be rich in mineral resources, including rare earth elements that are crucial to the U.S., particularly highlighted during the U.S.-China trade war, as they are essential for many high-tech products. Therefore, Antarctica could serve as a strategic resource reserve for the U.S., aimed at reducing reliance on external sources of rare earths. Historically, the UK, Argentina, Chile, Norway, France, New Zealand, and Australia regarded Antarctica as a valuable territory and proposed the idea of dividing it among themselves. However, the United States and the Soviet Union, two dominant powers at the time, opposed this notion. In 1959, they introduced the Antarctic Treaty, which declared Antarctica as a shared zone of peace, not to be divided or claimed by any individual nation. In 1988, New Zealand proposed a new convention to ban mineral exploitation in Antarctica, but the proposal was not accepted. Ultimately, in 1991. An agreement was signed in Madrid, Spain, establishing that no mining would be permitted in Antarctica for the next 50 years, which is until 2041. The agreement still allowed for exploration to identify potential mineral deposits during this period. This is why many countries have established scientific research stations in Antarctica, essentially to secure a position in anticipation of future development rights post 2041. However, the U.S. seems somewhat impatient, and they have already begun to establish military bases near Antarctica. One reason for the United States' urgency is its dramatic scarcity of rare earth elements, despite being otherwise resource rich. These critical resources are abundant in Antarctica, particularly on the Antarctic Peninsula, which is close to the U.S. military base in Ushuaia. The region also contains significant copper deposits, a metal vital for the development of electrical infrastructure. Therefore, the U.S.'s actions stem from two primary motivations. Firstly, due to a scarcity of rare earth resources, the U.S. aims to maintain its advantage in potential economic decoupling from China. Secondly, in anticipation of potential shifts in the global geopolitical situation, the U.S. seeks to ensure control over Antarctica's resources, positioning itself favorably in future resource conflicts. Historically, Argentina was once a close ally of the U.S. and enjoyed considerable wealth, even surpassing the U.S. in per capita income at one point. However, in the 1980s. Argentina decided to cut ties with the U.S. and follow an independent path. The country expelled American investments from critical industries such as oil, aiming to control resources and distribute wealth among its populace. Unfortunately, they underestimated the significance of international capital and its rules. Losing investments from the U.S. and the U.K., Argentina's economy and currency stumbled and has struggled to recover ever since. This serves as a stark lesson from the era of Peronism. Later, Argentina tried to leverage China's support to counteract U.S. sanctions. China invested heavily in Argentina, including projects like the Sky Eye Telescope, and purchased significant amounts of land. Argentina hoped that, with the Chinese market and support, U.S. sanctions would pose little issue. However, this strategy also proved futile. In recent years, public sentiment in Argentina has shifted towards a new foreign policy direction.、Much? The newly elected President Milei has proposed a full alignment with the U.S., even suggesting the elimination of Argentina's central bank and currency in favor of adopting the U.S. dollar, thereby fully embracing the international rules and order led by the U.S. This approach could potentially restore stability and rejuvenate Argentina's economy. However, for China, which has made significant investments in Argentina, this shift poses a major setback, as it impacts the progress of China's Belt and Road Initiative in South America. Now back to the fighter jets. Why is Pakistan cooperating with China to develop the JF-17 fighter jet? This can be traced back to 1980s and the Super Seven project. At that time, Sino-U.S. relations were thriving. Chengdu Aircraft Industry Group and Grumman Corporation had planned to collaborate. 
intending to introduce Western technology to undertake extensive upgrades to China's J-7 fighter jets. Their Super 7 aimed to create a superior J-7, drawing design inspirations from renowned aircraft like the MIG-21, F-18, and F-16, transforming the prototype into a brand new aircraft. However, following the Tiananmen Square incident in 1989, the U.S. terminated its cooperation with China. China then decided to import the Russian Su-27 as its future main combat aircraft, dimming the prospects for the Super 7. To continue the project, Chengdu Aircraft sought cooperation with Pakistan. Although Pakistan had already purchased F-16s, China's offer to help achieve autonomy in the aviation industry and initiate joint production was particularly attractive to Pakistan. By 27, the JF-17 Thunder began to enter service in small batches. In 29, the first JF-17 assembled in Pakistan was officially rolled out. The JF-17 was highly praised in Chinese media, with some even claiming it could rival the F-35 and outperform Europe's Typhoon and Rafale. The main reasons were threefold. First, it was equipped with a new type of active electronically scanned array radar, combined with advanced air-to-air -air missiles, enabling beyond visual range air combat. Secondly, it used a fly-by-wire control system, significantly enhancing maneuverability and handling. Third, it was the first to apply the DSI inlet, which improved air intake efficiently while also reducing radar cross-section to some extent. However, the JF-17's actual combat performance did not live up to media expectations. In the 2019 India-Pakistan-Kashmir aerial clash, the Pakistan Air Force claimed that a JF-17 downed an Indian Su-30 MKI, but it was later confirmed that the victory was actually achieved by an F-16 fighter jet and a sidewinder missile. Facing public skepticism, Pakistani officials claimed it was for political considerations that they could not openly credit the American-made equipment's success. Especially given the improving U.S.-India relations, the U.S. was not keen to see Pakistan use its sold weaponry in a contentious region. Later, Pakistan explicitly stated on a monument that the Su-30 was downed by an F-16BM and another Indian MIG-21 fell to an F-16AM. As for the JF-17's fly-by-wire controls, they were not without flaws. First, they were not purely fourth-generation systems and still retained some mechanical controls. Second, the system software was written in the widely used C++ language, which does not match the real-time and safety performance of the ADA language used by the U.S. military. The DSI inlet, also known as the Biconical Inlet, though an advanced design derived from the F-35, has its limitations. It functions optimally at speeds between Mach 0.8 and 0.9, with efficiency decreasing at supersonic speeds. Later, China also began using the DSI inlet, from the J-10C to the J-20, J-35, and even the latest modification of the JL-9 trainer jet. This might be sufficient for subsonic and transonic fighters, but it is less suitable for air superiority fighters seeking high speeds and even supercruise capabilities. While the DSI inlet allows the JF-17 to slightly reduce its radar cross-section, whether it significantly enhances combat effectiveness remains questionable. Discussing the JF-17 Thunder's air intake naturally leads to a discussion of its engine. The JF-17 uses Russian RD-93 engine, essentially an export variant of the MIG-29's AL-31F engine. China chose this engine partly because there was no suitable domestic alternative at the time and also to facilitate entry into the international market. However, the outbreak of the Russia-Ukraine conflict has led to self-preservation issues for Russia, exposing after-sales maintenance problems for JF-17 operators.
Reports from May 2022 indicate that JF-17 fighters in the Myanmar and Pakistan Air Forces were grounded en masse due to engine maintenance issues. This rendered them unable to perform missions and directly impacted the Air Force capabilities of these countries. This incident highlights the severe implications of engine issues for JF-17 operators. Although one of the main advantages of this lightweight multi-role fighter is its cost-effectiveness and low-maintenance cost, these benefits are meaningless if the aircraft cannot maintain basic operational readiness. Additionally, the poor reliability and low durability of the JF-17's RD-93 engines result in high operational costs for the aircraft. While the unit price of the JF-17 has soared from the original 15 million U.S. dollars to 25 to 30 million U.S. dollars, it remains relatively low compared to similar fighter jets. However, its hourly flight costs are among the highest in its class at 10,000 U.S. dollars per hour. This significantly diminishes the operational readiness of the JF-17. Engine issues have become an inescapable fatal flaw for the JF-17, deterring many potential customers who, upon seeing the maintenance challenges, have reconsidered their interest. With the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict, the future of the engine supply and support for the JF-17 looks even bleaker. It's noteworthy that quite a few potential JF-17 customers have ultimately opted for other aircraft models. For instance, IREC ordered 24 South Korean F-A-50s as early as 2013, despite China's continuous efforts to market the JF-17. As of January 2024, IREC has not shown a clear intention to purchase the JF-17. Countries like Argentina and Iran, although initially interested in the JF-17, have also abandoned their purchase plans for various reasons. In contrast, the JF-17's competitor, the F-A-50, has seen robust sales. The F-A-50, a light fighter developed in collaboration between South Korea and Lockheed Martin of the USA, employs the same technological standards as the F-16 and is compatible with various Western weapon systems. With its relatively low price, the F-A-50 has successfully entered the markets of Indonesia, Iraq, the Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia, and Poland, with total sales exceeding 200 units. This stark contrast in sales performance not only reflects the J-17's lack of competitiveness in terms of performance and price, but also highlights its shortcomings in aligning with Western standards and providing after-sales support. Meanwhile, Western fighters like the F-16 continue to dominate the global military aircraft market due to their mature systems and solid international reputation. Although the Pakistan Air Force uses both F-16s and JF-17s, its ongoing preference for the F-16 indicates that the JF-17 may not be fully meeting its expectations. During the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in the 1980s, the U.S. provided all military aid to Afghanistan via Pakistan. At that time, the CIA was developing all guerrilla forces entering Afghanistan from Pakistan. Thus, Pakistan and the U.S. have a strong foundation, particularly in the intelligence capabilities. It would be a mistake to assume Pakistan is wholly aligned with China. Pakistan's closeness with China has been primarily because of India's close ties with the former Soviet Union, while China's relations with the Soviet Union had broken down at that time. However, the pretext is China's then side with the U.S., which was fundamental. Now, as China and Russia challenged the U.S., Pakistan is undoubtedly aware of the dynamics. In recent years, pro-American forces in Pakistan have gained momentum. In April 2022, Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan was ousted by parliament, and pro-American Shabazz Sharif took over. Following Sharif's ascension, relations between Pakistan and the U.S. have noticeably improved. In September 2023, Sharif visited the U.S. and held talks with President Biden. The two sides agreed to strengthen cooperation in military, security, and economic sectors. 
the improvement in relations between Pakistan and the United States is influenced by several factors. These include the U.S.'s efforts to rebalance its influence in South Asia following its withdrawal from Afghanistan, Pakistan's severe economic challenges that necessitate Western support, and intensifying U.S.-China strategic competition. Additionally, complications in Pakistan's cooperation with China have also played a significant role in this shift. In recent years, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, or CPAC, a flagship project for the Belt and Road Initiative, has seen only four of the initially approved 27 projects completed. In critical sectors like power, Chinese companies have underperformed, frequently plunging Pakistan into power shortages. Pakistan's dissatisfaction is compounded by China's stinginess in project financing. In 2017, China pledged 62 billion US dollars in investment for the project, but to date, only less than 20 billion US dollars has actually been dispersed. Meanwhile, Pakistan has had to shoulder a heavy debt burden of 11 billion dollars for these projects paying interest rates between 5% to 8%. Pakistan perceives China as failing to uphold its commitments, damaging the mutual trust between the two. Some Pakistanis even openly state that CPEC might be a debt trap that could ultimately jeopardize national sovereignty. This perception has partly driven Pakistan to adjust its foreign policy, seeking improved relations with the U.S. and other Western countries to maximize its interests. Additionally, China's human rights issues in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, particularly its policies towards Muslim minorities, have caused concern and criticism among Islamic countries, including Pakistan. Moreover, escalating border conflicts between China and India have made Pakistan wary of being drawn into their confrontation, while Pakistan still hopes to maintain neutrality between China and India. Evidently, changes in the geopolitical situation, emerging differences in bilateral cooperation, increased international public opinion pressure, and shifts in Pakistan's diplomatic strategy have collectively weakened the one strong Iron Brothers relationship between China and Pakistan.